So my cousin moved back into town a little over a year ago, I want to say April to June of 2018. She has three kids and the youngest is a five-year-old girl. After they had moved into their new place and were finally settled in after a few weeks, I went to visit along with some other family members. We had an overall good time, a lot of good food and whatnot. After dinner, I remember my little cousin, who was four at the time, wanting to play that cootie game. It was in her room upstairs, and she needed someone to go with her because she was afraid of something. I put it up to her being in a new environment and still getting used to the house. So naturally, as an adult, I prepared to fight off any Escaped Monsters Inc. characters so she could get her game. We got to her room, and she refused to set foot in it. And I asked something along the lines of, is there something bad in here? She nodded and pointed to the game and I went to grab it. And then she told me to be careful in that corner of her room. I asked why and she says, That's where the screaming lady is. She's on fire and screaming a lot. I don't like her. Hearing this makes my heart drop into my gut like a lead anvil. I quickly grabbed the game and went downstairs. As soon as we were back in the living room, my cousin returned to her normal cheery self and we played some cootie. Later on that night, I asked her mother, my first cousin, if she knew about the screaming lady that her daughter told me about. She said that her daughter refused to sleep in her room until they make the lady go away and has to come sleep in her parents' bed just about every night since they moved in. No one else has had any weird experiences in the house since moving in, but this four-year-old girl is beyond terrified on a daily basis. A month or so passes, and I don't really hear much more about any spooky experiences, so I eventually came to the conclusion that my cousin was simply having very specific reoccurring night terrors. Cut to yesterday evening. It was the birthday for another one of my cousin's kids, so I stopped over to bring him the new Fire Emblem game for the Nintendo Switch. I usually stop over a few times a week to hang out since it's not far from my workplace. So today being my cousin's birthday didn't make my stopping over a rare occurrence. We played some of that, we played some Mario Kart and some Super Smash Brothers, and everything went well. Until later on in the evening, we were waiting for a pizza to arrive and I was in the kitchen grabbing some soda with the cousin whose birthday it was. Out of nowhere... We both pick up on the very distinct smell of burning. My cousin and her husband came out of the living room into the kitchen, thinking we had cooked and burned something, but obviously we hadn't. The house filled up with this smell, and if I was blind, I would have guessed that I was right next to a massive bonfire minus the heat. During this time, my youngest cousin, now five, was taking a nap on the couch in the living room. She suddenly starts yelling for her mom, who goes in to check on her. Everyone else follows, and she inconsolably is crying and screaming, saying, I can hear the screaming lady in my room. I hear her screaming. So basically everyone had the same lead anvil heart dropping into their gut feeling that I had last year, and we went up to her room, with her mom staying with her. We saw nothing, but the smell of burning had changed from that of a bonfire to only what I can guess a person smells like when they're burning. A heavy waft of burning hair smell followed by some other burning smell that I hadn't experienced in my entire life thus far. We quickly went back downstairs and told her mother what we had experienced, and she decided for us all to go outside to the front porch patio area until the pizza arrived. My little cousin was still hysterical, saying she didn't want to hear the lady screaming anymore. We tried to calm her, and eventually she seemed to settle down a bit, still scared but not screaming and crying. We continued to sit there for maybe 10 minutes. My two other younger cousins and I were comparing our Pokemon Go collections and my youngest cousin and her parents were watching some kid-friendly YouTube stuff to distract her. Out of nowhere, everyone hears the most blood-curdling, terrifying and loud scream come from inside the house's second floor. It must have lasted for maybe 15 or so seconds straight. Just multiple long, horrible screams. And after that moment, everything went dead quiet. My five-year-old cousin went back to throwing a fit, and everyone else was visibly shaken. I decided that it was time to leave at that point. It was about 9.30pm, and while pizza would have been very tempting, I was not hungry in the slightest anymore. 
I thanked them for ordering a pizza even though I wasn't going to have any, and they wholeheartedly understood. I wished my other cousin a happy birthday and told him not to spoil the new Fire Emblem game for me, and went home. I couldn't sleep at all last night, and I didn't even turn off my light. I was a tired mess at work today, and I'm still fearful of going to bed tonight. I texted my cousin a few times today and this evening, and she said that the burning smell didn't go away until around 4am, and no one slept last night there either, and are looking into getting some kind of help so they can feel less terrified of their home. I feel terrible for them and worse for my young cousin who has been actually seeing this screaming lady in her bedroom and I haven't been able to get the smells coming from her room out of my head and I've been getting hints of them on and off as my day has gone on. I'm hoping that it's just a residual smell memory and not something more ominous. I still don't think I want to try and sleep tonight, especially not with the light off. This is very strange and at first I thought this belonged in a dream or night terror forum. Now I'm not too sure. My boyfriend and I have been together for nine years now. I've always suffered from night terrors, however that's not something you bring up on the first date. This was back when my boyfriend and I had been dating for a few months and had recently started sleeping together. We were sleeping in his place. I woke up in the middle of the night and noticed we were holding hands. I thought it was cute but... I noticed that his hand was so pale and thin. My boyfriend has hands like an orc, to be honest, and my eyes got used to the darkness, and I saw his hands crossed on his stomach while I was holding a third, pale hand. As I became aware of this, something that looked like a woman with long black hair hanging over her face sat up from behind my boyfriend's form, looked at me, and laid back down. I stroked the hand with my thumb as you do when holding hands with someone. I don't know why I did that, I just wrote it off as dream logic. This was in the beginning of a relationship so I didn't tell him about it because I didn't want him to think I was crazy. Years passed and we're now living together. He is aware of my paranormal beliefs and night terrors. Out of nowhere I came to think of that dream. Did I ever tell you about that night terror I had at your house when we just recently got together? I asked him with a little laugh. I saw someone who looked like Sadako in your bed when we slept. I almost got jelly. I joked, but he didn't laugh. He got very pale and said, Did she try to hold your hand? I was taken aback by his reaction. I told him I did hold her hand and even remembered stroking it with my thumb. My boyfriend then revealed to me that as a child, he'd have a reoccurring nightmare that a woman with long black hair and white hands tried to hold his hand, but he'd wake up in a panic before she ever got to him. He never told me this because he just wrote it off as a childhood nightmare. Now neither of us think they're nightmares anymore. Before I begin this story, I feel it's important that I give out a few details first. So me and my three close friends like to drive around and walk around spooky places as we generally get bored with our university nightlife fast and need something to sort of excite us. All of us are also big believers in the supernatural and three out of four of us have experienced some sort of paranormal experience. All of us are from Malaysia and we Malaysians tend to believe in a lot of supernatural stuff as it is woven tight in our history and culture. Now Malaysia had a terrible incident way back in 98 or 99, don't really remember, where two apartment buildings collapsed due to uneven lands. Majority of the tenants of those two apartments died. What's worse is that a number of them didn't die when the building crashed but died due to lack of oxygen. You can look it up. The building is Highland Tower. So we decided to go to the area nearby there as the site where the tragedy happened is closed, though there are no guards patrolling. Just outside the gates is a small neighborhood, and boy, the neighborhood is creepy. You see the area that is the rich area, and yet a good amount of houses were empty. What's stranger was the fact that the whole neighborhood was absolutely quiet, 
A very uncommon thing in Malaysia, as we're incredibly loud. It felt as if though everyone just decided to up and leave the area. So as we walked around, a couple of strange things happened. First, the dogs in the neighborhood started barking at plain air. We Malaysians believe that when dogs start to do that sort of stuff, it means that they are seeing something that we aren't able to see. So we decided to avoid any area which the dogs are barking at. It's important to note that we made a few rules before doing all this. Again, a Malaysian thing, I suppose. 1. Don't call out real names. Use nicknames. This is so that any wandering spirits won't be able to latch itself to you. 2. Don't look back if you feel a presence that is often a big mistake, as even if you look behind, you find nothing. You've actually just shown the spirits around you that you've noticed them. 3. Don't make loud remarks about strange things. We believe that if you see, hear, or smell anything strange, it's best to keep it to yourself first. If you need to tell someone, then just use hand gestures or make some excuse to sort of hint at them. This is similar to the second one, as any remarks could easily attract unwanted attention. As we walked throughout the neighborhood, we heard footsteps behind us. Remembering the rules, none of us looked back. See, the footsteps were odd as they just sort of randomly appeared out of nowhere. The footsteps also started to get faster, so one of our groupmates, the expert as we called him, led us to the exit using a shortcut as it was getting too uncomfortable. And here's where stuff happens. See, the expert is one of those guys who can see things, or at least feel it to a certain extent. Now because we're big believers, we don't question him, we just follow as we all want to get through this as clean as possible. See, the expert is my best friend and he often brings me to the side to whisper to me if anything is really wrong and close to being dangerous. This place where we parked our car was directly beneath this huge tree. So my best friend calls to me, to my side, and whispers to me, Dude, don't panic. But when we get to the car, keep quiet and make sure the others keep quiet too until we reach a place with more people. Why? There's a woman on the tree above your car. She's been looking at us since just now. Following his advice, I went on and started the car like usual while making some small jokes trying to take everyone else's attention away. As I reversed the car, both my mates and me noticed in the reverse camera that there was a clear shadow of a woman sitting down on top of the car. Again, not wanting to scare everyone else and to antagonize it further, we keep quiet. We went to a nearby restaurant and sit down for a while. The woman was still on top of the car, according to my mate, and was hiding itself. The worst case scenario is that if it follows us back to our university dorm and decides to latch into one of us. So I told the guys that when we entered the car, I'm going to play a special prayer recording out loud using the aux cord while also reading the prayers myself. I'm not a super religious person, but I do believe in God and his protection. If the plan didn't work, then we would just drive around or hang at a McDonald's until 5am because that's the holy time for my religion and the woman would disappear. We entered the car and I immediately started playing the prayers. My mate was driving this time as I wanted to focus fully on the prayer. The moment I started the prayer, the car suddenly got heavy, as if there was an extra passenger when there shouldn't be any. I continued to play the recording along the journey, and to my shame, I fell asleep halfway. By the time I woke up, it was nearly 2 a.m. and we reached the dorms already. According to my friend, the prayers worked, but took quite a bit of time as the woman only let go as we were entering the university area. I asked if he noticed anything strange, and he said that after all three of us went to sleep, he heard someone huffing and puffing, but in an angry way. He also noticed that several times the prayer recording got interrupted as the volume went up and down, as if someone was trying to purposely mess it up. When I was rather young, in second grade in fact, my family lived in the country, out in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. There were no children for me to play with, and I tended to get a bit more lonely than you'd expect. When we were in the process of moving out there, parents had this double-wide trailer. 
there was one incident that took many years to be certain I hadn't imagined it. While on one expedition to the plot where my family were going to put the trailer, my mother needed to make a stop to use the restroom. With no gas stations for a good ten miles, Dad pulled the truck down this dirt road looking for a place to stop. There, maybe 200 to 300 yards from the two-lane road, we found what looked to be an abandoned gymnasium from a school. Dad decided to use that place as the bathroom and we headed in. I don't recall much about the building, though one thing always stuck out in my mind. Near the doors we entered through was this rather massive pile, or massive to my child mind, of clothing. I remember after doing his business, my father stood at the foot of it looking up at the clothing. He seemed to be thinking of something, but he never said anything about it. Several weeks later, with the trailer in place, we moved out there and the gym was largely forgotten by me. However, that didn't stop weird things from happening. Well, not weird in the sense of stuff moving around or anything of that sort. Weird sounds. Within a month or so of living there, I was playing on the front porch when I heard laughter. Now before I go further, let me clarify as to where we lived then. The trailer was a good hundred feet back from a dirt road and... Across the road was the home of an elderly man I'll call O. Behind his house was a rather extensive stand of pine trees that reached right down to the two-lane highway, probably a distance of 500 to 600 feet total between where I was and the highway. In any case, as I sat on the front porch my father had built, playing with some of my toys, I kept hearing laughter. Not one child's laughter either, but several. It sounded to my ears like five or six kids were playing somewhere off behind where O lived. Not having anyone to play with, I remember wondering where those kids were and if they play with me. Walking up to the road, I could tell that the kids seemed to be playing in the woods as their laughter came and went. After a moment, I called out to them that I wanted to play too. As soon as I said that, the laughter cut off. Dead. No pun intended. Silence. One moment there was laughing and fun, and the next it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. I decided that I'd scared the kids off and went back inside. This happened several times and eventually I just gave up. I'd hear the kids laughing and playing, but they never seemed to get closer. After a couple of times of this, I remember telling my mother, and she got this really odd look on her face before telling me that she didn't want me playing out front any longer. We lived there another year or two before we moved and I largely forgot the experience. It wasn't until many years later when the story came up again in conversation with my parents. That's when I found some of the story out and personal investigation told me the rest. My mother said that the reason she'd reacted that way was because she heard a rumor that the area we moved to was haunted. She didn't have all the details but felt it was tied to the old gym. All she could say, or would say, was that, quote, something bad had happened, and she was afraid. After my parents passed away, I kind of forgot the story again. It always stuck in the back of my head as just something weird, but that's it. Eventually, one bored night, I happened to stumble across the website for the church we had attended. On a lark, I shot an email off to the pastor asking if there had been a gym near where I remembered. I didn't expect to hear back. Two months later, I checked my email to find that, yes, he had actually replied. Here's what he related to me. There had been a gym that once stood near where I described, though it had long since been torn down. The gym has been part of a private school which had stood there from roughly 1900 to about 1979 or 80. Early in the spring of that year, a tornado had gone through and demolished most of one wing of the school, in doing so killing a number of students. The building had collapsed, burying the students under the rubble, resulting in the death of a number of them. I think between 10 and 15 students. After this, it was decided to close the school. As they were demolishing it, they cleaned out clothing from lockers in various places, dumping it in the gym in the tall pile I remember seeing. The gym had been left standing because it was hoped that one of the local churches might use it, but given what happened there, well, it ended up being left abandoned. Curiously, the property behind O's house had also been part of the school's property at one time, being used by the students as a kind of playground area. 
This did explain why O kept digging up old toys, mostly metal trucks and such, which he gave to me. Looking back, I've come to the conclusion that what I had been hearing was in some way tied to the old school and the loss of life, though I also wonder if, in some way, it was my childhood imagination running wild. That's probably one of the problems I have with the story. For all I know, my parents could have mentioned what happened at the school at some point and I overheard it and my lonely state of mind and imagination just ran wild. Before we start, I will preface this with the following. I have always been interested in cryptids, occultism, the paranormal, but until about two years ago I was skeptical about it. About two years ago I started to go after that kind of stuff with a friend, Z, who had a lot of luck with it. I have experienced a lot since then, including this story, and continue to delve into the unknown. One final note, I'm not ingrained into the culture much anymore, but I am about one-third to one-fourth native, though not Navajo completely. Now then, about a year ago, me and my friends had decided to go camping up in northern Arizona near Flagstaff. We chose this spot because we all wanted to escape the heat of Arizona's weather. Originally, the plan involved more people, but by the time we actually left, we were down to me and my friends Z, V, and P. This worked out, though, as it meant we could just take one car, something that may have saved us that weekend. Now, we weren't experienced campers or anything, but we had the basics. A tent, flashlights, fire starter, and I had my Mosin's Nogant. Not the best I know, but it fired a big round and I had ample ammo at the time. We chose a site based on reviews a bit north of Flagstaff and followed our GPS there through some windy back roads. Eventually, we hit a Y intersection and went left as the GPS told us to go. By the time we eventually find a parking area and get out look for a good campsite, it's well past 10 p.m. So I take my rifle and flashlight. Z and V also grab flashlights and we head off. We trek through the woods for about 15 minutes, looking for a good place but to no avail. We were all feeling tense as we searched. Something fell off and we all vocalized it, almost like we were being watched. We start to head back through a clearing. We passed the car, but... About three-fourths of the way through, I ask Z a question and get no response. Finding this particularly odd, I turn around to find him about halfway back in the field watching behind us, shuffling in place like he wanted to walk back from where we had just come. I call out to him, and he snaps out of it and swears he only looked back for a second and catches back up with us. Now before you say he got got, I doubt this because of what happens later and that he has acted completely normal and looked normal ever since. We get back to the car without anything else happening and decided maybe we should have taken the right path at the Y instead, so we drove back. We arrived at the Y and take the right path this time, but getting a whopping 30 feet before we stop. There's a ditch in the road and we aren't sure if the car can make it over, so Z gets out to check. It takes him less than a minute to figure out that it couldn't and walks up to the driver's side window to tell us. It's only after saying it can't that he freezes in his tracks and just stares behind the car at the intersection and simply says to look in a hurried voice. We all contort ourselves around the car looking through mirrors in the back window but we all see it. A tall figure easily eight to nine feet tall standing behind a tree watching us. Once confirmed, Z isn't just seeing things, he basically vaults over the car and dives into the back seat, slamming the door behind him. During the commotion, we lose sight of the thing for a moment and by the time we look back it's still there, but in a different stance, just stalking us. We quickly get a flashlight out of the sunroof while I rapidly load my rifle. During this time, it moves again, slightly deeper into the tree line, but still watching us. We are stuck in a staring match for what feels like forever, as we are too concerned backing up will make it strike, and currently it isn't for whatever reason. Eventually, something broke our line of sight with it. I can't quite recall what. I believe I was trying to get people to move so I could line up a shot through the back window, but I can't be sure and knowing what I'd do now, it probably would have done nothing but make us feel in control. 
Regardless, in this time frame, we lost it as it presumably fell more into the woods, and we wasted no time slamming it into reverse, turning back to where we originally came from and gunning it. I kept my window down with the barrel out facing the woods it went into. While I never fired, I swear I saw something dart around in the darkness. I am sure that it chased us because of that, and from the scream we all heard while driving away, it sounded feminine, but not quite human, and way too loud to be anything good. We decided to stay at a motel that night in Flag and went back to Phoenix the following morning. That's how the story ended until earlier this year. For those of you who live in Arizona, you probably heard last winter Flagstaff got hit pretty hard with a big snowstorm. Naturally, I went up right after the storm ended to have some fun with friends in the cold, sled, that kind of stuff. I hate the unending heat the rest of Arizona has, so Flagstaff is my getaway whenever I want to cool off, and it's easier now because I have some other friends that live up there and go to NAU. We'll call them L and W, and I went up with two other friends, R and Q. Most of the trip was fun, but I did experience some stuff, though mostly unrelated to this sub, more paranormal stuff with Q. The second to last night, though, we decided to go sledding on a particularly good hill for it near the sports center. Arena and stadium both sound too grand, but it's like where people play football or something. The sledding was fun and all, but after me and L, who, like Z, also has a lot of experience, felt very off, like something was watching us. We trekked through the small woods around the area, and while I didn't see anything, I definitely felt an ominous presence. Meanwhile... L told me once we were in the car that he did see something pop its head over a hill and stare at him before retreating back away. He said he couldn't see all of it, but it seemed big from the silhouette he could see. This one I'm not so sure of as I couldn't see it myself, but it definitely felt very similar to a year ago. So take the second one with a grain of salt, I suppose. Do you guys think both one or neither were skinwalkers? because I still can't explain that first night no matter how many times I look back on it. This past year was my senior year of college and I was thrilled to be living with an alumni of my sorority who I am very close with. We'll call her Abby for clarity's sake. Abby and I weren't actually supposed to live in the apartment we ended up in. We were originally going to be living in a townhouse with two other girls, but they started so much drama a month before we were supposed to move in that we had to contact our landlord to find a different place within their company to live. Thankfully, we found a two-bedroom, one-bathroom basement apartment in a quiet area off campus. The first month was fine and without incident, but as the days went by, some strange things began to happen in the apartment. One morning... Abby woke up to a kitchen cabinet open. She wasn't that concerned about it and figured that I had just forgotten to shut it the night before. The next morning, a different cabinet was open and once again, she shrugged it off. However, I went home one weekend and she woke up to find every cabinet in the kitchen wide open and the sink running. Needless to say, Abby was scared and spent the night at her boyfriend's. Two weeks later, we were watching TV and heard the bathroom door close. I tried to calm Abby down by saying that the fan we kept in the bathroom blew it closed. However, when we went to bed, we thought we could hear someone walking around in our living room. There's no way someone broke into our apartment and hid the whole day only to come out at night and screw around with us. I was home the whole day and Abby was home from 11 in the morning on. That incident took place shortly before Christmas break and all was calm in the apartment until February. Abby had gone home for the weekend and I was home alone, relaxing on the couch and doing homework. It was pretty late at night so I turned on the TV for background noise and curled up on the couch to sleep. I woke up at 2.32 in the morning to see Abby walking through the front door, smiling but not saying anything. I blinked, still groggy from sleep, and asked if she was okay. She just looked at me and proceeded to take off her shoes and walk into the kitchen. Something about her didn't seem right. Like this girl looked like Abby and walked like her, but it wasn't her. I asked her again if she was okay, because it was so early in the morning for her to be coming home. 
Abby looked at me, smiled, and began washing something in the sink. Something inside me felt a profound sense of dread, like I was in actual danger and I needed to get away. As quickly as possible, I went to my room and locked my door. My roommate followed me because I heard someone tapping their fingers against the door. Once, twice, three times, four times, five times. It wouldn't stop. I didn't say another word because it felt like if I did acknowledge her, it gave her more strength. I know that doesn't make much sense, but that was my instinct. I curled up beneath my blankets and stared at my bedroom door, almost waiting for her to kick it in. My eyes felt heavy, and the tapping was almost like a metronome enticing me to sleep. As I drifted to sleep, the taps seemed to slow down to a trickle. The morning after, I was exhausted. It felt like I had taken 20 Advil PM to help me sleep and I remember everything that had happened last night. Cautiously, I left my bedroom and saw that Abby's bed hadn't been disturbed or slept in. I went to the living room and her shoes and purse weren't there. A cold feeling crept into my spine as I sent her a text asking if she had come home that night. She responded that no, she hadn't and wouldn't be coming home for another two days. But I checked the sink, and the bowl that Abby had been washing had been cleaned and put away. I firmly believe I was not dreaming or hallucinating, and I know this wasn't some elaborate prank by Abby because she would never do something like that. I firmly believe something took the shape of Abby that night, and that its intentions were not good. There were a few other experiences in that apartment, but nothing so dramatic as what I went through that night. It was this... A doppelganger. I have been a caregiver for a few years now. I have worked in last chance houses and organizations that aid and house the mentally ill, and I have been a care provider that would go to the individual's home to clean or do personal cares. Currently, I oversee an entire branch of a home care providing company that stretches out to several small towns in one moderately sized city. In my years of working this field, I've come to notice things. I consider myself a rational person. I need hard evidence. I'm by the book. But this field of work has shown me that some things can't be explained away. Which is why I'm here, because it bothers me. I need other people to see something I've missed. To make sense of these encounters. I'll start with one, and then post the others, and it will not be in order. Incident number one. I have a client who has a debilitating disease, one that attacks and eats away at his nerves. Yes, recovery is possible if you're a millionaire, but it'll never be a full recovery. He also suffers from a brain disorder that corrupts his memory, personality, and behavior. Despite all of this, he's a wonderful client. I rarely come down from my big boss tower, but when I do, it's to cover a shift with him. My first few visits with him were as expected. He could only talk about four topics that he could remember, and he'd repeat them throughout the shift. But he's so energetic and positive that it's a joy to be around him. He'd sometimes turn and look at me and say, Dang, baby, you look good. I ain't lying. Then forget who I was entirely. His wife and I would share a laugh each time he did, as we think he thinks I'm her from when they first met. This was my usual encounter with him. On one visit, his wife mentioned that she's fighting to get him on a revolutionary treatment. Not available in the States. I wished her luck. She had a sad, hopeful smile as she drew in a drag from her cigarette, nodding her head as a thanks. At this point, he looked like he wasn't getting any better. He was declining and there wasn't much hope left. A month or so passes when I have to cover for his usual caregiver. I knock, open the door, go inside and hear the two of them talking, having a real conversation. I approached them and the client looked at me and was present. He was actually looking at me and knew who I was. He then went on to tell me about his week, what he did, who he saw. He talked about this coherently. Still some stumbling, but there was flow to his sentences. They made sense, no repeats. I was blown away. He's still in his wheelchair, but the change of cognition was incredible. I look to his wife. Mind you, I'm smiling like a moron, and I ask her, Did you get the 
treatment going overseas? He's a whole new man. His wife ashed her cigarette, looked at me, and smiled like I've never seen her smile. The kind of smile a kid gets when winning a goldfish at the fair. Nope, she said with a pop of the lips. He got hands laid on him. What? Now, I'm not religious. I was once a Satanist, raised Roman Catholic. Unfortunately, bad memories there and determined that it's all just a coping method to comfort us when faced with ours or others' mortality. Yet what she told me next has now become a haunting thought in the back of my head. We were at church and the preacher man came up to us and put his hands on him and started blessing him. Everyone was singing, praying, and then the preacher finished and gone back up to the altar. And I swear to you, my man looked at me and said, I want to go to that altar. He got up from his chair and walked 25 steps there and back. Everyone was crying. He hadn't walked since 2016 and... At that point I tuned her out. Like I've stated, I don't believe in that stuff. And I felt like she was in need of something good in her life, so... She spun this story to me. I smiled, I nodded my head, and I got to my task with her husband. Three years of no walking, then all of a sudden walking? Because he was touched by a holy man and in the way the church doesn't try to cover up? I call nonsense. So, I'm doing my tasks with him and he starts talking to me. I mean, really talking about things he remembers from his past. Things I never heard him talk about. I'm just going along with it. Try not to think too much about what his wife said. Then he turns to me and says, as he usually says it, Man, I gotta poop. Wheel me into that bathroom, baby. I gotta go. I wheel him in towards the toilet, put the brakes on the wheelchair, and was about to help him when he suddenly stood up from his chair, took a few steps, turned, and sat on the toilet. I could only gape. I had no idea what I just saw. This man, the last I saw him, was on a steady decline. He couldn't get up from his wheelchair without major assistance yet he popped up out of that thing like he's been faking it this whole time. He saw my face and told me, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been walking. I'm doing good, baby. I don't know, guys. I really don't know. This didn't convert me. Honestly, Christ would have to show himself to me to get me believing, yet I can't explain this. There's no cure for this disease. People in this state don't just progress positively like that without new and aggressive treatment. I'm still bothered and shaken by this. So to give some backstory, my neighborhood is pretty quiet, especially at night due to the number of young families and elderly couples that live on my street, which makes staying up in the early hours of the morning more relaxing and also a bit cooler knowing I'm most likely the only person in the street that's awake. The only thing is that I've had some creepy experiences, like hearing noises or even seeing a few drug deals, but most of that can be chalked up to living next to a big forest with lots of wildlife or just some sketchy neighborhoods. But for the past week, I've been trying to find a logical explanation for the strange events that keep occurring. It started at 2am last Tuesday morning. I was just sitting in bed on my phone with earbuds in, something I do almost every night, when I began to hear whistling coming from out my window. I took my earbuds out and began listening to the whistling trying to come up with an explanation. Normally I'm not scared by anything in my neighborhood this late and to be honest I get more excited that something is happening and I'm there to witness it, but this time felt different. I wanted so badly to get up to look out my window but I was almost paralyzed with fear. I don't know what came over me, but every minute that went by of this whistling, I felt the pit of my stomach growing larger. It went on for almost an hour, and for the entire hour, I waited for the whistling to start a tune or a song I could actually look up, but it just kept whistling the same note in a strange pattern. It would whistle one note for a good minute, then take a break for another 30 seconds, and then return its one-minute whistle, until about 20 minutes in... When the whistles got shorter and closer together, 
only to return to the original pattern after about 10 minutes. What was even more strange was that whatever it was was pacing in front of mine and my neighbor's house up until it stopped when it retreated back down the other side of the street. As I heard it leave, I almost immediately felt the pit of my stomach subside, and while I was still confused, I decided that I should just go to sleep before I scare myself even more. So the next day I asked my parents and even some of my friends that lived close by if they had ever heard anything like that. Everyone assumed it was an animal, which made me feel a lot better, but I wanted a definite answer of what I heard. I stayed up for hours that night researching types of animals that were local to my area and the noises they made. I didn't find anything that matched. This only left me more frustrated that I had no clue what it was, so I continued staying up in hopes that I would hear it again and that this time I would look out my window to see it, but with my luck, I never heard the whistling again, except lots of other weird things have been happening. After the whistle, I began hearing someone or something walking around in mine and my neighbor's driveways, and sometimes even yards very late at night, but whenever I go to check, I can't see anything. Then about two nights ago, when I swear, I saw a figure of a person lurking behind my neighbor's car. Then the night after that, I saw what looked like a flashlight in the woods near my house, and whatever it was that was holding the flashlight was running out of the woods. And then again, last night, I swear I saw a person crouching near my neighbor's car just looking around. I thought I was done researching because I couldn't find anything about animals, but now I've begun researching any stories even similar to mine, hoping that I'm either not alone, or even better, someone has the answer to the strange experiences, because I would like to start sleeping at a normal time again and not be worried about either a stalker or a poltergeist coming to get me in my sleep. When I was 12 years old, we moved to a house on the outskirts of Los Angeles County, not far from Knott's Berry Farm in Disneyland. This was in the early 80s. We lived there for a year and the house was completely haunted. Here's a list of a bunch of things that happened. One, Every night, after everyone went to bed, you could hear someone digging with a shovel outside the window, but there was no one there. If you turned on the lights, the sound would stop, but only for a few seconds, maybe 30 at the most, and would then resume. If you went outside to check, the sound would be gone and there was no one there. Come back in, and after a few minutes, the digging would continue. 2. I had OCD as a kid, and would put all my toys in their place at night. On several occasions the following morning, they would be scattered all over the floor as if someone had played with them during the night. I would yell at my younger siblings thinking they had done it. My mother would tell me I was the last one to go to sleep and the first to wake, so it wasn't them. 3. Every night without fail at 11pm, outside the upstairs window, you could hear children yelling and playing in the backyard. If you looked out the window, it was pitch black and there was no one there. You could also see all the neighbor's yards and there was nobody anywhere. One night I listened carefully to try to make sense of what they were saying and yelling and I realized that they were playing kickball. Kick it, kick it, run, go, 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 yeah. Stuff like that. This happened every night. On more than one occasion I went downstairs and opened the door to the backyard. The sound was gone. You couldn't hear it from downstairs, only upstairs. Four. My grandmother came to spend the night once. She got so scared she never came back. She slept in the upstairs spare bedroom and said she heard noises outside the window. When she looked out the window, down below she would see a shadow walking up to the front door, but no one was there. No one was casting the shadow, apparently. 5. My aunt spent the night once in the same bedroom and something similar happened. Noises outside the window. When she looked down below, she saw lights moving and shadows moving towards the front door, but no one was there. Like my grandmother, she struggled to explain what it is she heard and saw. She never came back to visit. 6. The house rented cheaper than any other house in the area. Every time the landlord would come back to pick up the rent, she would ask if everything was okay. Did we have any problems? It was always odd. Parents would invite her inside the house, and she would always refuse. 
7. The neighbors to the right of us were very strange. They were an older couple. The man would never say a word, not one, not even hi, but the wife was always extra nice. She would ask the same things as the landlord, is everything okay, are you guys doing good? She seemed to know something. 8. We were playing with one of the neighborhood kids once, running around. We all ran back to our house, and just as we went through the front door, he stopped in his tracks. We said, what happened? He said he wasn't allowed in the house. His parents forbade him. Why? Because he had spent the night once with the kids who lived in the house before we did a year earlier. During the night, the mother of the kids who used to live there started screaming and grabbed the kids and ran out of the house. As they ran, they all saw a blue mist or ghost with a distinct pattern of a head and shoulders. 9. The only person in my family to see the blue mist ghost was my father, who said it walked down the stairs and directly into his closet. His description was identical to that of our friend who refused to come inside the house. 10. The last day we were in the house, we had finished putting the things in the U-Haul truck and we were cleaning up the last of things. I remember we were eating pizza too. As we were getting ready to walk out of the house, my father said something like, finally getting out of this miserable house, or something similar. Basically, he insulted the house. There was a wall panel three or four feet to the side of him next to the kitchen. The panel shook and came off the wall and hit him over the head. Hard. We all saw this, and it happened right in front of me. What's interesting about all of this is the fact that none of us really talked much about it while we lived in the house. Speaking for myself... I always thought I was imagining things and tried to make sense of what I saw and heard. My younger sibling did the same. For example, the kids playing outside the window. I thought, what are those crazy kids doing playing so late at night, and why every night? I didn't know the answer, but thought there must be an explanation. Being about 12 or 13 years old at the time, I guess I wasn't old enough to figure out that something was very, very wrong. It wasn't until we moved out of the house that we all started comparing stories. And it was always, what, you too? My parents were the only ones that knew something was wrong, but they didn't want to scare me and my siblings. We were in a bad economic situation at the time and apparently we could not move out right away. There's a lot more that happened, but these are probably the ones that stand out the most. We would always hear doors slam upstairs and wonder who was up there. Or did the wind do it? One of us would go check and all the doors would be open. But we heard a door slam shut. Our cat was a happy-go-lucky animal, but he would all the time freeze at the stairs when least expected, stare intently, and hiss with its fur standing on end. He would always hiss while looking at the top of the stairs. As kids, we would think the cat was crazy. Years later, we realized the cat was actually seeing something especially since the cat never hissed again in its life once we moved out. When I was two years old, my parents found a house at a very good price, so they decided to buy the place. There's nothing much to say about the first years since I was too little, but my parents and my older brother told me stuff that happened the first months. At the end of the first week in the house, my mom woke up and found that the stairs had lines colored with crayons. She blamed my brother and then they cleaned the stairs. Two days later, the stairs had colored lines again. This time, my mom threw away the crayons. After one week without crayons, my mom found the stairs with black lines painted on them. That was when she began to think that something really weird was happening. Then in the next weeks, the lights began to turn on and off by themselves. The same happened with things like the microwave, blender, and televisions. My parents investigated the house, but it was difficult back then without the internet. After some months, a previous owner told them the truth. A woman and her son were murdered there by robbers. My parents were unable to sell the house, so we stayed there and a Catholic priest blessed the rooms. After this, the paranormal activity decreased, but we lived in the house for another 12 years. So let me talk about my experiences. One, when I was 12 I was eating with a friend. 
We were in different angles. I was looking at the TV and he was looking to the kitchen. And then the conversation went like my friend saying, I didn't know you have a little brother. I responded, yeah, he's a baby. He's upstairs right now. And my friend said, I'm talking about the kid that was running in the kitchen. Wh what? The kid? By then, almost every member of my family except for me had seen the kid. This is how we refer to a ghost that looks like a kid. I turned around and he was there running to the laundry room, so I immediately went there but I didn't find anyone. My friend got really scared so we ended up going to his house. 2. When I was 14 I used to wake up in the night with screams and then I began to listen to the conversations of children or older people in the background. The first time I thought it was my brother but when I turned on my lamp I saw him sleeping and there was no one else in the room. Things like this happen a lot of times. I don't know the exact number, maybe more than 15 times. 3. When my little brother was 5 I was babysitting him in the house alone and he asked me, Can I play with the other kid? Which kid? The kid in your room. I went there and my old toys were on the floor but no one was there. My brother told me he saw him when he got upstairs but once again I didn't see anything. So I've had several weird experiences in this house since I moved here at the end of May and have posted about a few. My friend, who's a skeptic, and his wife came over, and I told them about the encounters, so we started exploring around a bit to see if we could see any shadows or anything. Well, across the street from my house is a grain elevator, and even though it looks like any other grain elevator, it kind of has a creepy vibe to it. My friend, who we will call T, decided to walk over to it around 10 p.m. on August the 10th, 2019, last night as I write this. He walked over alone while my wife, T's wife, and myself talked in the front yard. We see T walk back and looks pale and flushed and he says he saw a really long bony hand with long bony fingers and a really long arm reach around the corner of the grain silo around 8 or 9 feet off the ground and he shined his flashlight at it and it disappeared. He has never believed in the paranormal or humanoids or anything like that and he wasn't making it up because we could all tell he was genuinely terrified. Well, we were all curious, so he and I walked back over to the area and we both saw a head pop out around the corner incredibly quick and kept hearing footsteps behind us. We would get these cold patches where the air felt 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder and we would both get covered in goosebumps. We walked about 10 minutes along the train tracks and kept hearing noises and asking each other if we both heard them. We went and got our wives and didn't tell them what we saw or felt and brought them over and they both said it felt way colder in certain spots and kept getting goosebumps too. At one point I swear I felt something brush against my hand. So afterwards we were standing in my front yard and I told T what he saw kind of sounded like a skinwalker or a wendigo and started showing him drawings and... He was freaked out and said that it's exactly what he saw. We went back over once more to see if we could see any more signs of it and he freaked out and looked pale and sweaty and swears he saw yellow glowing eyes about 9 feet off the ground peering around the building where he and I saw what looked like a head. Like I said, he was super skeptical and after this he was terrified and sweating and looked flush. I don't know what he saw or what we heard but... It wasn't animals because it would only be a few footsteps that would stop soon after we did and whatever he saw was probably nine feet tall. We even tried to recreate what he saw when he saw the hand but we couldn't reach as high as he saw it just standing on the ground. We both had this feeling of dread and being watched the whole time we walked on the tracks. We were all sober at the time too, no drinking or drugs of any kind at the time we saw this stuff. Now, I do live about 5 to 10 miles from a mass Native American slaughter site in the 1800s and a battlefield. Does anyone else have a story about a Wendigo or Skinwalker in eastern Washington? 
I would really like to know. You may have heard stories about skinwalkers, Native American witches, or spirits that turn into animals to cause harm. But at the lake where I spent the larger portion of my childhood summers, they went by a different name, Deerians. The story has faded to most families at the lake over time, but mine still recites it in hushed whispers around the campfire. The legends of the Deerians begin sometime in the 18th century. Settlers from Europe flocked to northern Michigan with hopes of getting a head start on the fur trade. That's when they found the lake. And at the lake, there were native tribes. Most were welcoming and hospitable. Others were quiet and kept to themselves, but most were kind. Most. There was one tribe, a single tribe that resided in the swamps of the western side of the lake, and they were vicious. They would attack anyone who strayed too far into the swamp. Man, woman, child, settler, even other tribes. Nobody knew why they were so aggressive, but they tried to leave them alone. But the attacks added up, and then followed the deaths and disappearances, and the settlers had had enough. They began to set up traps and ambushes in the swamp where they knew the tribe would be common hunting grounds, pathways, even the village itself, but they were always abandoned, inhabited only by a herd of white-tailed deer. Sometimes, people never came home from the swamp. they go missing for days on end, but would later be found completely mangled. Most blame wolves or a bear or a mountain lion, but upon further inspection, the only tracks that would ever be found in that area belonged to deer. But that's not the story. No, my story takes place hundreds of years after the deaths and disappearances of the French settlers. I had always dismissed the stories of the Deerians as just that, stories. Tales to frighten wide-eyed children and keep them within the confines of the family property. But one evening changed all of that completely. Bald eagles are a common sight at the lake, but their nests are not easy to find. Therefore, when my cousin said he'd found a nest while he was kayaking along the river that ran through the swamp, my dad and I naturally wanted to see it. We hopped into the rickety old canoe and, with what little daylight we had left, set off towards the swamp. As we approached, we noticed something. It was a doe drinking peacefully from the water. She didn't notice us at first, but something made her look up and notice dad and me, and it was at this moment I knew something was up. White-tailed deer are another dime a dozen animal at the lake, though if you get more than about a hundred feet of one, they take off, but this deer was different. They just stood there, and as we got closer, I could tell this deer was wrong. She looked as if though a child had read about a deer one time in a book, then drew one from what little we understood. I got close enough to the deer so that I could almost touch her, but then she calmly turned and walked like a marionette into the woods. Dad and I looked at each other, but laughed it off. It was nothing. It had to be. Just some deformed deer. We entered the river, and immediately I was hit with a wall of sound. Birds, crickets, and cicadas accompanied us on our journey, and as we turned the first bend, I heard something in the tall grass to my right, rustling. A big animal, perhaps that malformed deer. Dad didn't seem to notice, but I listened closely. Rustling, then to my surprise, a low whisper, and with a hyena-like giggle, the thing ran off into the woods. I felt uneasy. I felt watched. I wanted to tell Dad, but I was worried he'd tease me, so we just kept paddling. Eventually, we stopped to rest. We scanned the tops of the trees for the eagle nests until we noticed something. The swamp which had previously been bustling with life, was empty. No birds, no crickets, no cicadas. No noise at all until I heard another low whisper from the grass to my right, then another to my left, then giggling all around. I no longer felt watched. I felt hunted. Something splashed in the water behind me, but by the time I turned and looked, all I saw was the tracks of a deer. I looked at Dad who I had never seen afraid before, and I knew he was absolutely terrified. We began to paddle for dear life, and with that, the swamp roared to life. We paddled against the current, as birds dive-bombed us and insects swarmed us, and the giggling all around. 
We paddled for what seemed like an eternity until suddenly, silence. Dad and I were in the open lake, safely away from the confines of the swamp. I took the time to try and calm myself until something plunked into the water beside me. I looked and saw an arrowhead sinking slowly into the shallow water of the bay. I hesitantly turned to seek its source and only saw a stag walking like a marionette disappear into the swamp. My husband and I have always been cat people. In fact, we wouldn't have been able to marry non-animal people. Pets are essential for a comfortable and civilized home, don't you think? Now, just before we got married many, many years ago, we adopted two baby kitten litter mates at our local Humane Society on Impulse. They were only five weeks old and had already been there for a week, far too young to be away from their mama. Tiny little shivering tuxedo kitties, a girl and a boy, huddled together and absolutely terrified. It was obvious we had to take them both. Because they were so young, they bonded to us like no other cats ever have before or since. Astrid was very much a daddy's girl and Siegfried was a mama's boy. This was given from the start. They were always the closest of buddies, as litter mates who have been raised together usually are. Astrid was short-haired, brave as a lion, dumb as a rock, with amazing instincts. Considering she hadn't had the benefits of her mother teaching her anything, Astrid was one of the best hunters I'd ever seen and a ferocious scrapper. She could even bring down crows. Her brother was a beautiful long hair, big and sensitive and timid, despite his puffed chest posturing and loud macho bugling. Neighborhood tomcats would try to start fights with him and he would shriek, bringing Astrid on the run to beat up whoever was trying to mess with her brother. Siegfried, to his disgrace, wouldn't even stick around to help her. He'd run to the door and start scratching on it frantically to be let in. Astrid was an extremely expensive cat in the long term. In our early years, my husband and I were stone broke, and we racked up I don't know how many thousands of dollars on our credit cards for all kinds of Astrid disorders and mishaps. We flew her up to Seattle for radiation treatments for her thyroid, her liver almost failed, necessitating week-long stays at the vets. She broke all the bones in one foot once by catching it on a patio bench. She stopped eating several times and got terribly thin. My husband would grind up dry food, make a porridge from it, and hand feed her with a syringe. Yet, we never really minded all the trouble and expense because she always managed to bounce back from the brink of death, right up until her final illness. Astrid was always so single-minded and stubborn. She was an affectionate juggernaut. Siegfried died of cancer a few years before his sister, which was heartbreaking. Astrid lived to be about 15 years old. Just before her own death from cancer, we moved into a new house. Instead of a cramped, dark bungalow, our new house was bright and roomy, with big windows everywhere, and even better yet, from the standpoint of an arthritic cat who loved to play in water, it had a doorless walk-in shower. Astrid just loved that house, and we were so glad she got to enjoy it for a while. Our backyard lets out on the BLM land, and after we brought her home from her final visit to the vet, we buried her out under a big sagebrush bush, which we could see from our living room. Knowing Astrid's indomitable will and rather dim intellect, plus her fondness of the new house, I guess we shouldn't have been surprised when she came back. It started out with glimpses out of the corner of the eye for both me and my husband, although we didn't mention it to one another until after the noises began. Distinctive Astrid noises would happen mainly at night when our two other kittens were accounted for and sleeping on our bed with us. The loud bonk of her head against the underside of the coffee table. We had that table for years and she never did learn not to stand up under it. The thud of her jumping off the dining room table. The rustling and rummaging through the garbage bag in the kitchen looking for treats. The sharp jing of a cat toy being slapped at in passing. Then Astrid started joining us in bed. My husband would distinctly feel her weight as it landed on the bed and stomped clumsily across his legs, and we could see everything on the bed very clearly. Nothing visible was causing it. To make things more interesting, Cow Kitty, aka CK, 
the black spotted white feral cat we had tamed and adopted, would greet her by lifting his head in her direction and cordially saying, in that sweet way he had. One of Astrid's habits in life was wedging himself between my head and my husband's. Since she was really his kitty, she'd leverage her butt against my sleeping face in order to really position herself for a thorough kneading of daddy's neck, sometimes for hours at a time, purring the whole time. He'd get a sore neck and I would wake up to a mouthful of cat hair. So, during one of her incorporeal visits, I woke up to hear loud purring between us, but nothing was there, just the purring. My neck hairs tried to crawl up to the top of my head. You know that feeling you get when all your senses start to ratchet up. But then I thought, it's just Astrid. She loves us and she'd never hurt us. And I relaxed completely and went back to sleep. No big deal. In fact, some nights when the noises began while my husband and I read in bed, we'd look at each other and start laughing. And did I mention that my husband is a skeptic who's very uncomfortable with discussing the paranormal? Even he started taking it for granted. CK, too, would often peer with great concentration into our bedroom doorway from his spot on the bed. He'd murmur a question or a greeting at our visitor and lay his head down on his paws again. Not everyone was so casual about Astrid. When we got our kitten, Flashman, a loud, bold, brassy Maine Coon, Flashman would often stare at the bedroom doorway, fizz up, and hide between our pillows with his butt sticking out. But then again, Flashman was never properly introduced to Astrid in life like CK was. Eventually, I was concerned that Astrid didn't understand she was dead and would be upset that we were snubbing or ignoring her. I would call out to her that we loved her, but that she needed to get going to where she needed to be. Our vet told us that our cats often come back after death in a new form to be with us again. If so, Astrid was delaying the process by spending her nights stomping around the house and bonking her head on the underside of our coffee table. I think she finally got the point. Astrid was very strong-willed and single-minded, but even she could sometimes catch a clue. Eventually, she stopped visiting. I've told lots of people about my Astrid experiences, and I can tell they don't know if I'm joking. I'm known for having a pretty dry sense of humor, or if I'm just simply crazy. However, I've read a lot of real-life accounts which indicate that our experiences with Astrid aren't so much out of the ordinary. All the same, it takes quite a special cat to come back, regardless of how much it loved its owners. It really doesn't surprise me in the least that Astrid managed it. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, the hiccup burp is the buttersock cult mating call. <laughs>